Paul, beginning in verse 1. Brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, or the, the first things, the most important things, that which I also received, how Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas and then of the twelve, and after that he was seen above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are dead. Fallen asleep means dead. And after that he was seen of James and then of all the apostles, and at last of all he was seen of me also as of one born out of due time. For I am the least of the apostles, that am not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was in me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Let's pray. Our Father, what I want to do today, what I want to accomplish is help people see life through the lens of the gospel. And not just the gospel in, in a word, but the gospel in its totality, in the sense of the aspects of the gospel. I want us to see life through the death of Jesus for our sins. I want us to see life through the reality of his burial and, and also through the reality of his resurrection. Help us to look at life this way, to see life from that perspective. And if we can do that, Lord, I know it's life-changing. I know the result will be a desire of service, of Christian service, that is truly earth-changing, world-changing. You have people all over this planet who claim you as Lord and Savior, and proclaim your truth, Lord Jesus, to those who do not know you as Savior. So I ask, dear God, that you would use this message to change the way we look at life, change the way we see life, so that we can see it through the lens of the gospel. And may our ministry, our message, be tuned to that gospel, so that all who get to know us personally would see gospel living people, gospel-breathing people. Lord, I think about this virus and the fear in this world because of it, all over, our, all over the globe, all over the world. And it continually reminds me of how quickly things like a virus can spread. And then, Lord, I think about the gospel and the need to share it across the world. And I pray that you would help us to see our responsibility to go to those around us and share our faith with others. And help us, dear God, to recognize the grand opportunity you've given us. Because you are alive, we will one day live. So, dear God, I pray that you'll bless this service, bless the preaching of the message. May it be crystal clear in the ears of those who hear it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And I know why D.L. Moody liked that hymn. It is, it is great. I, um, now, we don't have an evening service tonight, and we don't have a children's church this morning. So what that should tell you is, is I really am not on any clock of any kind. Um, so, um, and, even, and even the nursery, I'm not worried about. I think my wife's in there, and I can, I can buy her something nice. So, you know... I would just say buckle up. I don't know what time they turn the sermon audio feed off, but uh, we'll see, right? We'll see. I've always had really good vision. I was born that way. I was one of those people. Do you know who those people are? You, you probably know the kind. They would say things to you like, you can't see that. 
and in just kind of an obnoxious sort of way. I mean, I wasn't obnoxious. Other people were. But I, I just the way they will say that to you, you mean that sign that's right there? You can't read that sign? And and my eyesight was better than perfect vision. I don't Perfect vision, I guess, is 20-20 vision. I, I had much better vision. I would read the very bottom of the eye chart, and I would stand back five or ten feet from behind the line. I just had great vision. I didn't have any trouble at all seeing anything until I got diabetes. And then I didn't realize this until I got diabetes that it affects your vision. And I knew something was wrong, actually, because of my vision, because I started noticing that my left eye couldn't focus as well as my right eye, I couldn't see as well out of my left eye. And in fact, when I was driving along the road, if I had a drink in the cup holder and I pulled it up to my face, I would cross over my right eye and then everything would go blurry for a second. And then I would pull it back down and everything was clean and fine. And then I started doing this as I'm driving, you know. This is really neat. Blurry, not blurry, blurry, not blurry, blurry, not blurry. You know, I'm not a scientist. But I don't know how many times you have to test that until you forming a hypothesis. And I was forming one of those, kind of developing some theories as to what might be wrong with me. And I thought, I'm having trouble with my eyesight. Um, I, it, my wife figured it out when I started hitting left curbs. You know, you're turning and you don't, don't see as well on my left side. And I just kind of bumped the curb a little bit. And, and in, my, in my defense, I did that before when I had great eyesight, so I don't know that that was proof positive that, uh, that I was having eyesight problems. But my primary doctor, when he discovered that I had diabetes, said, you must go get your eyes checked. And so uh, after a lot of delay and demand, uh, of course, I, I, I ignored him the first year maybe, but after that, I said, okay, I'll go get my eyes checked. And that was quite an experience. I don't know if you've ever been to an eye doctor. It's really amazing what they do. They've got these really cool glasses that have all these different levers on. It looks like something Benjamin Franklin invented. Uh, and, and you just kind of push all these levers on the side, and then they, they're putting all these different lenses on your eyes to see where your vision is. And, and so out of that, the doctor handed me a piece of paper, tried to sell me eyeglasses for hundreds of dollars, of course, my wife's very savvy to this and had already researched and said, no, you'll be buying your eyeglasses from Zenny Optical. And so uh, what would be hundreds of dollars was like eight bucks. And I bought like eight pairs of glasses or something um, and promptly began losing them, which was good that I did. But, but after a few weeks when the boat from China made it and my glasses were on the boat, it takes time to get here. When it made it from China and I got the glasses, I remember putting them on for the first time and let me tell you, it is amazing how you can see all of a sudden. My eyesight had been gradually fading. I remember, and this probably was the moment when I realized I need to get glasses, is when I was preaching one Sunday night, and I looked down, and I looked back up, and everybody was blurry. And somebody called, asked, raised their hand, and I'm thinking, yes, you, right there in the back. I can see movement, but I can't tell who you are from here. I need to get glasses. And when you put on glasses, it's just amazing how you can see. And I wonder if we see the world, if we see life through the glasses of the gospel. Because the gospel is like a pair of glasses. It's seeing life as God sees it. If you wear glasses, you know when you take them off, it changes things. It makes a difference. You go from being able to see things relatively clearly to things being blurry. If you want to see life like God sees life, you need to look at life through the lenses of the gospel. It makes everything make sense. Do you know what the gospel clarifies? It, it teaches that everybody is a sinner. All those people that you work with, your family, friends and acquaintances, the neighbors in your community, every person is a sinner. The gospel reveals that God is righteous to condemn sinners for their sins. That no person, even that sweet little old grandma 
who makes the best chocolate chip cookies. That precious person in your life who's so kind and so nice and so warm and so loving is still, if outside of Christ, under the righteous condemnation of God against sin. The gospel reveals that God is love because God gave himself. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. In his great love that God has for mankind, and he has enormous love for mankind, his creation, he sent Jesus to be the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrifice to make atonement for our sins so that all of our unfilthy, unholy, godless actions, our sins, would be poured out on Jesus, that he would become the righteous sin bearer, and that we could be holy and righteous in him. But the gospel also reveals that Jesus did not stay dead. He rose from the dead, and that gives all of us who are in Christ new hope for eternal life, that because he rose from the dead, we will rise also. I will say this. I think 1 Corinthians 15 is one of the most central passages of Scripture proving the resurrection of Jesus. But its main emphasis is not on the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection of believers. This is all about our resurrection. That's what the resurrection means. Jesus is the first fruits of a great harvest of resurrected people. Because he rose from the dead, we have a promise that we will rise from the dead. That we will one day, if we and when we die, we will one day rise from the dead. And he rose again from the dead, giving us hope that we will rise. And this gospel, which is so clear and so concise, and let's just say it, it's simple. It's like someone putting on a pair of glasses. I can look at life from God's perspective for the first time so that now it clarifies for me how I should love my wife because it says I love my wife like Jesus loved the church and gave himself for it. How I should pursue personal holiness. He has redeemed me, bought me back from the literal slave market of sin. He has purchased me with his own blood and changed me from the kingdom of darkness to the to his own kingdom of light. And teaches me how I should serve God in my ministry with the same fervor and love that he has for me. The gospel relates to nearly every facet of our lives. My friends, once you put on gospel glasses, you can see clearly how the gospel relates to your marriage, how it relates to your family, how it relates to your children, and children, how it relates you to your parents. Your parents are just as sinful as you are. They fail. They sin. And the gospel helps you see that. And by the way, they were once your age and failed in many ways like you're failing now. The gospel helps you see that. The gospel puts in perspective our friends and friendships, our careers, our business decisions, how we spend our money, what vacation we choose to take, what, what clothes we wear. All of that should be in some way changed by the gospel as we see the world the way God sees it. I, I want to say this. It clarifies the way I think about my church, my ministry, other believers, and even unbelievers. Why are we surprised when unbelievers sin? Why are we shocked when unbelievers do something evil? They're sinners. The gospel should inform our politics. Did you hear that? It should inform your politics. And I'm not talking about conservative or liberal. I'm not talking about Democrat or Republican. I'm talking about how we look at government 
how we respond to government. The gospel should inform our politics. It should help us think rightly about education. The gospel should influence our approach to the community. When you start to think about people as sinners, my friends, it just rips, it rips the blindfold off if we can keep using the same eyesight analogy. When you see the only solution is Jesus as Savior, when you think about Jesus dying in our stead, in taking our place on the cross, it clarifies everything. It is like looking through glasses for the first time. Everything just comes into focus. And for the Apostle Paul, the gospel was the foundation of his life. It consumed him. Everything he did was the result of the gospel and its influence on his life. Paul built his ministry. He had a pretty good ministry, didn't he? He built his ministry on the gospel. And I think it would be great if we could think like Paul thinks here. If we could actually, cognitively address life the way Paul did, that we have a sure gospel, and that now because of our faith in that gospel, we have a basis for all that we do. Let me say it this way. When we see the gospel for what it is, and we recognize the gospel message for what it is, it produces in us ministry for Christ. Gospel ministry. Would you consider first with me? We have an unassailable gospel. It's unassailable. The gospel is based upon three important facts. Look at verse 1 again. Moreover, brethren, I, I declare to you the gospel. Now, moreover is just a word that lets you know we have a new section of Scripture. Paul's not really pulling in information from before. He says, Brothers, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached, I evangelized unto you, by which also you've received and wherein you stand, by which you're saved. And he gives that beginning in verse 3. I, I delivered to you what I received. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. These are the three facts of the gospel. Fact number one, Jesus died for our sins. Jesus' death was on our behalf. That's what this phrase, for our sins, means. In other words, Jesus didn't suffer on the cross for his own sin, like the people who were on either side of him. Those thieves were there justly because they had sinned, they had broken the laws of the land, and were dying for those things. But that sin for the breaking those laws. But Jesus suffered on the cross for our own sin. He was actually dying to atone for the sins of the whole world, 1 John 2, verse 2. And this explains a couple of gospel things. We are sinful, all of us. Every person here is a sinner. Stop faking like you aren't. If I were an evangelist, what I would do is stop here and start saying, all of y'all are dirty, rotten sinners. Can you not see kind of an evangelist doing that? It's true, though. We're all sinful. We're all sinners. We have pride problems. We have selfishness issues. We want things done our way. We're fearful. We, we struggle with temptations. We, we have a host of sin problems. We're all sinners, and we cannot save ourselves. I'm sorry, none of you is even close to being good enough to save yourself. You just can't. We, we don't know each other. Even husband and wives probably don't know each other as well as we know ourselves. You know yourself. You know you can't save yourself. You know you can't. You think of all the great people in the world, world history, you go back and you start thinking of people who have sacrificed themselves for others in ways that are almost unimaginable. And I'm telling you, they are sinners and they can't save themselves. The load of sin is so great. The weight of sin is so heavy that you cannot save yourself. That's the first fact. Jesus died for our sins. Second fact, he was buried now, this teaches us that Jesus physically died. Jesus' body died. The trauma of crucifixion resulted in physical death. 
Jesus' soul and spirit went to be with the Father. I actually think that during the three days that Jesus' body was in the ground, he was doing a lot of things. I think he actually went down to Tartarus, to the abode of the dead. You can read about that in 2 Peter, that he went down to the, the abyss and he actually preached to the demons who were there and he declared victory over them. I, I think Jesus took a victory lap during those few days. The Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell, and some people have taken that to believe that Jesus was still paying for sin even after he physically died. Friends, he declared on the cross, it is finished. To tell us die. It's finished. It's done right here. It's all done. All the ransom was paid. All the debt was paid right there on the cross. All the sin was atoned for right there on the cross. What Jesus did in those few days while his body was lying in the ground was take a victory lap to declare himself to be victor over sin. And then he, fact number three, he rose from the dead. And this was his declaration over death, his victory over death. He rose again from the dead. And this is the aspect of the a gospel that Paul is emphasizing in this chapter. If you want to get a sense, Paul is not really emphasizing the death of Jesus here, and he's really not going to emphasize the burial of Jesus here, but he is going to emphasize the resurrection of Jesus. If you just keep in your mind, 1 Corinthians 15, that's the most important section of the Bible dealing with resurrection. Even though, as I say, the primary emphasis and application is for our own resurrection, this is the place you turn to when you want to talk about the resurrection. This is the good news. Friends, that Jesus died in our place, rose again from the dead, so that we will rise together with him. Now, those are the three facts of the gospel. And I say the gospel is unassailable because this is the second point. These facts are supported by three proofs. He says in verse 3, I delivered unto you what I received. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. And verse 5, he was seen. Cephas... The 12, verse 6, 500 brethren. Verse 7, James. Verse 7, all the apostles. Verse 8, last of all, he was seen of me. We have here proof that Jesus rose from the dead in this section of Scripture. The first proof is divine revelation. Look at verse 3. Paul preached what he received. The language may indicate that Paul is referring to church tradition. Some argue that Paul is simply restating what's called the kerygma. It's a Greek term for proclamation. Um, it's the doctrine that the early church preached. Uh, they say it's the kerygma. And, and that word kerygma, meaning proclamation, this is the proclamation of the early church. And I think that some would believe that, but I actually think Paul is saying here that he received this not from men, but from God himself, that it was divine revelation that gave Paul the gospel. In fact, keep your finger here and turn over to Galatians chapter 1. Just a couple of pages maybe. Go through, go through 2 Corinthians and you come to Galatians. Go to chapter 1. And I want you to look down at verse 12. He says in verse 11, rather, I certify to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Do you see that? That couldn't be more plain, could it? The gospel that I preached is not after man. He's using the same language as he's using here in 1 Corinthians 15. Now look at verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Where did Paul get the gospel? From divine revelation. It came directly from God. He was not taught the gospel. He did not receive the gospel from other people. He received the gospel directly from the Lord Jesus. And I'll tell you, the first proof that the gospel is true is that God has revealed it to be true. Divine revelation. There's a second proof here, and it's the scriptures. You see, the facts state in, in, in facts 1 and 3, in verse 3, the fact 1, Jesus died for our sins. Do you see the phrase afterward? What does it say? According to the scriptures. Fact three, look at verse four. Jesus rose from the dead. What does it say? According to the scriptures. 
In other words, the Apostle Paul says, I'm not just making this up. God didn't just reveal this to me specially, but the Holy Scriptures that we have in our hands that they did not always have direct access to in the early church like we do, but that we hold in our hands. These holy scriptures actually teach that Jesus died on a cross and that he rose from the dead. In fact, it teaches that directly in the scriptures in the Old Testament. And that's likely what Paul is referring to. Now, I would argue that's possible that the Gospel of Luke has already been written by this point, that Paul is referring to Luke as the Scriptures. Of course, Luke was Paul's companion. So it could be that he's referring to a New Testament text. But most scholars believe that Paul is referring to the Old Testament. And where do you find the death and resurrection of Jesus in the Old Testament? Will you find the death of Jesus in Isaiah 53, that he died for our sins. It's not just even the death of Jesus, but it's the death of Jesus for our sins. In Isaiah 53, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. But you also find in Psalm 16, Messiah does not remain dead. The psalmist there is speaking of himself and then clearly he flips to speaking of Messiah when he says that God would not leave his soul in hell. He would not leave his body in hell. He would not let his body see corruption. He wouldn't let his body decay, in other words. And this idea of new life and resurrection, the, the body not decaying, is that idea that Psalm 16 presents of Messiah. So we have the scriptures as proof that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead. But there's a final proof, and it's the one that's the most evident in the text, that Peter saw Jesus alive with his own eyes. That the 12, and of course by this time it was only the 11, right? Because Judas was gone. But the 12 refers to that special group of disciples, that kind of inner circle that Jesus had of disciples who saw Jesus alive. Thomas, John uh, chapter 20 teaches us, actually saw the nail prints in Jesus' hand. And Jesus pulled back his cloak to show his side where the Roman spear had stabbed him. And he says, be not faithless, but believing. They saw Jesus risen from the dead. He says in verse 6 that 500 brothers, 500 believers probably here men and women, had seen Jesus risen from the dead. And he said some of them, many of them, are still alive even to this time. Now why is that important? Because when you write something like this, that somebody who's dead rose from the dead three days later, you better be able to back it up. And he says 500 people saw him at one time, and of those 500, many are still alive. You can ask them, did you see Jesus? Hey, what about you? Did you see Jesus? And you would have a whole cacophony of voices come back and say, yes, we saw Jesus risen from the dead. He was seen of James. This is probably Jesus' half-brother. And then all the apostles, which refer to people who are in apostolic ministry. And then finally, he testifies that he himself had seen Jesus alive after death. This is proof, friends. If, if historians and legal experts have taken the story of the resurrection of Jesus and have tried to apply historical method and have tried to apply legal theory to this story of the resurrection of Jesus, and both historians have said this fits all the criteria, the resurrection of Jesus fits all the criteria for being historically provable. Legal experts have looked at the resurrection of Jesus story and have said on the, on the basis of known law at that time and at this time with all of this testimony both in divine revelation and scriptural proof and eyewitness testimony there is more evidence than you would have in most criminal cases to prove a point. I'm just going to tell you something. Jesus is alive. 
He's not dead. And, and because of that, I can say without question, our faith is on an unassailable gospel. People have tried through the centuries to prove the gospel to be wrong, but they can't because it's based on three provable facts. Jesus died, was buried, and rose again from the dead. And it's supported by three indisputable proofs of divine revelation in the scriptures and eyewitness testimony. And if you hear that, then the question is, well, so what? If, if that's true, then so what? And of course it means salvation from sin. I think anybody who's a Christian knows that part of it. If you don't know Christ, you need to come to know Christ because this is absolutely true. Jesus died for your sins, was buried, and he rose again from the dead. And you need to trust in him alone for salvation. But for all the rest of us who know him as Savior, the question is, so what? What does this mean for us beyond our salvation? And I think if we agree that we have an unassailable gospel, then I think we can also agree that faith in the gospel produces more than just salvation from sin, but it's foundational for ministry. It's, it's the basis of our ministry life. I'll say it this way, number two. Faith in the gospel produces gospel-based ministry. Our ministry is the fruit of God's work in us. Look at Paul. But by the grace of God... I am what I am. And his grace was bestowed upon me, not in vain, not emptily, not with any va uh, no value, but I labored more abundantly than everyone. But it wasn't even me. It was the grace of God which was with me. You see, Paul looks at his ministerial labor and work for Christ as coming out of the gospel. And he says, because of what God gave to me in the gospel by his grace, I now labor abundantly and and I love the words labor abundantly because it's the kind of labor so few people recognize today most of us don't ever really labor abundantly um, you work yourself to exhaustion mentally sometimes maybe 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 there are times where you you exhaust yourself physically uh, I know uh, packing and moving can do that um, sometimes your jobs will require you to stay up late at night, work, work long hours. But even then, usually in white-collar jobs, it's more mental labor than physical labor. When Paul says, I labored abundantly, he says, uh, uh, labor here means to work to exhaustion, and abundantly means to an extreme amount. And it wasn't just something that Paul did once. It was something he was doing all the time. You go through the life of Paul, and what you find is a person who says, I'm dying because of my gospel ministry. And I think if you read all the things he did, you would agree. Yeah, you probably are. If, if you read about the kind of life Paul had, you would say, it's ludicrous, Paul, what you're doing. You're killing yourself. You're bringing yourself to a point of death. And that's why I say most of us probably can't say that we've labored to that extent that abundantly. I can tell you that there were times when I was in the military that I probably got to a place where I was laboring abundantly, but it wasn't prolonged. I, I imagine that if we continued down the road we were going, people were going to start getting sick. Some were going to start dying. It could have happened, but it wasn't prolonged. We, we stopped long before we got to the point of laboring abundantly. Uh, Paul, a person who'd been shipwrecked on multiple, multiple occasions, who often went without food, who sometimes went without clothing. Paul, and in, in just trying to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, was just killing himself. And he said all of those efforts were for evangelism. In fact, if you look at this section, what you find in these first 11 verses is Paul using various terms to talk about his ministry. In verse 1 and 2, he says the word preach, which really is our word evangelism. He says in verse 1, I preached unto you. Verse 2, I preached unto you. And both of those words have the idea of evangelize. I evangelized you. In verse 1, he also says, I declare this to you, which means to make something known. In verse 3, he said, I delivered something to you, which means to take what you have 
and give it into the hands of another person to pass it off. And then in verse 11, he uses the word preach again, but this is a different word. It means to publish or proclaim. In other words, this, if you want to know what Paul's ministry life was, Paul's ministry life was primarily about sharing the gospel with people. But that's not all the kinds of ministries you can have. I, I mean, you can have other ministries, right? And they're, and they're perfectly fine. This was Paul's ministry. And I think in a sense we can say, this should be a ministry of our church, and this should be a ministry that we all should take seriously. But I think we can embrace all of ministry life by this and just say whatever God's will is for us in ministry, we should be willing to labor, even if it's called for, to labor abundantly to do what God wants us to do. And you can do that if you believe you're going to rise from the dead. I mean, what's death if it isn't permanent? What good is that? What's death if it's only temporary? That's why Paul's going to say later, death has no sting. The grave has no power over us. Paul says, I labored in my ministry to exhaustion. But he says, friends, it wasn't the result of human effort. And this is the part we have to get away from. Because I think there's a lots of us who, a lot of us who, who tend to think of our ministry as just being something we work really hard at. That we're going to do with all of our might. And, I, and I'm glad we have the desire to serve God with all of our strength. But would you realize that whatever ministry you have, ultimately it's because of the grace of God working in you? Grace here probably refers to a couple of things. It's a reference to God's gift of salvation. Paul could not have ministered for Christ if he had not first been saved. But I think it's also a reference to God's continuing work through the ministry and the divine empowering of the Holy Spirit. God gives you the power to serve him. And so Paul, here's a man, he never thought of himself as the greatest Christian of all time. He never thought of himself as being that great of, a, of an apostle. He, he, he saw his ministry and he often, I'm sure, while preaching, remembered some of the terrible things he did in persecuting the church of God. But for Paul, it didn't put him into a tailspin of depression. Do you know what it did? It caused him to marvel at the great grace of God. He says, I can't believe where I am. Can you believe it? This really is remarkable. The one who persecuted the church, the one who hauled men and women out of their homes and threw them in prisons where they were often tortured and sometimes even to death, who held the coats uh, of those who picked up rocks and stoned Stephen to death. That one now who, who persecuted the church proclaims the very message on which the church is based, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he says, the grace of God labored in me. So if you think, Paul says, in giving me any awards or any trophies or, or a pat on the back for how hard I'm working for Christ, let me let you know it has nothing to do with me. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. You see, he's looking at his life through the lens of the gospel. He sees both his own life being spent in the ministry of serving Christ coupled with the fact that it wasn't even to his own glory, but the fact that Jesus was being glorified because he was the one empowering him to do it and even giving him the opportunity to do it. Hmm. Paul just marvels. He just, he just says, wow. God works through me. I don't know if you've ever come to a, a realization of that in your own life. God works through you. I sometimes have people come back to me and say, Pastor, there was this sermon you preached and you said this phrase and I'm looking at them and I'm trying to put on the look of, oh yes, I remember that, when really I'm going, I have no idea what you're talking about. I've forgotten. You're up here preaching. I probably preach thousands of minutes a year. I say 
hundreds of thousands of words a year from a pulpit trying to expound the words of God. But God's Holy Spirit takes one little phrase and he burrows that phrase down into your heart. He just drills it all the way down into your heart. And God uses that phrase. And you come back, Pastor, you know, you said this one time. And, and, uh, and I wrote it down. And I put it in my Bible. Or I put it on my refrigerator. And it's just it's been a blessing to me. And I'm just thinking, praise the Lord. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I've forgotten. Most of the time, I've forgotten. And I'm just going to tell you, it isn't because of me. It's just God's grace. It's God's grace to you. It's God's grace through me in working through me. It's, but it's his grace. It's his gospel. And all of the glory should go to him. B because you see, friends, when, when you realize that we have an unassailable gospel and it should produce in us a desire to minister for Christ, then we can say God works through us to bring others to have the same faith. Or even you could, by extension, say, if, if we look at all of ministry, God just works through us. And that's what Paul is saying. Whether it were I or they, whether it's me or whether it's one of the other disciples or whether it's one of the 500 brethren or Peter or James or John, whether, it, whether it's any of these people, whether it's Jude, whether it's Luke, whether it's Epaphroditus, it, it doesn't matter who it is. It doesn't matter who started the church. It doesn't matter who's pastoring it now, whether it's Timothy or Titus. It's really immaterial. It's still all about God. It's gospel ministry working through us. God works through us. The process here is really simple. God, Paul, others. And it's still the same way. It's God, me, others. And it's God, you, others. And it, and it could be on your street corner. It could be at a family function. It could be in a prison, right? It could be anywhere. It's God, me, others. It's God, you, others. God works in your life, and you take what God's working in your life and the grace that he's giving to you, and then you take it and give it to others. He says in verse 1, I received the gospel. And in verse 1, I preached the gospel. And then in verse 11, the Corinthians believed the gospel. It's God, you, others. And it's always been that way. And so it doesn't stop at you. It's not you others, you others, you others. That's how a lot of preachers have built kingdoms for themselves. They give the impression that somehow they themselves came up with all of this information and or they package it in a certain way to make you think that they've come up with all of this themselves. And so then people just go, oh, isn't he just so great? Or isn't she just so wonderful? And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter because it's not them. It's God. God. You know, something I learned during my PhD studies? You know, sometimes commentators are wrong. Sometimes the scholars are wrong. In fact, it's really fun to read people who've been alive and are now dead and they've written over a long period of time to see where they change their mind. And you read their first book and you go, man, that makes sense. Wow, these guys are smart. And then you read their next book and go, wait a minute. He's contradicting what he said back here. And then you read the third book and they go, I'm really sorry. When I was younger, I had it all wrong. And then they rewrite it and you go, oh, you know, how didn't I see that? And, you know, now that now that you're this far along in this guy's life and you're reading all this, you realize that he had it wrong. And sometimes he had it right and he went to something wrong. And, you know, you look at these people that seem so brilliant and you realize it really isn't them. If there's any good that comes, it's God. God did it. Not us, and not a man. You see some people who labor and labor and labor, and they serve, and they become great servants of Christ. And people just go, isn't she a great servant? Isn't he a great servant? And in the reality, the answer is yes, God is using them, but it's God the one who's using them. So I can say unequivocally that the gospel ministry is really God's work. And the preacher is of no consequence. Paul says it, it's maybe it's me, maybe it's them. It doesn't really matter. We preached, you believed. Is God and me and you. But the ultimate source is God. And the point is, is that the Christians believe the gospel message because it came from God. They received the gospel. And in verse 1, the way he says received is that it was a one-time act. It was a decisive act. And they were taking their stand on the gospel, which gives them the idea that there is saving faith once and for all, that salvation once begun doesn't need to be repeated. And they believe the gospel, verses 2 and verse 11, which is our word for faith. The Corinthians put their faith in the gospel. Paul worked. 
Because God gave him the power to work. He gave him opportunity by grace, and he gave him the empowering to work by grace. And then God worked through Paul to bring people to faith. And God works through you in all sorts of ways to bring some to faith, to encourage the faith of others, to encourage those who are downtrodden or discouraged or who are in sin to come back to a life of walking with the Lord. God uses you in your ministry, but it's God who is doing it because that's what the gospel means. If you didn't save yourself, then you're not the one doing your ministry yourself. It's God who does it. So can I encourage you in conclusion, put on the glasses of the gospel. Just put them on. You can't see right without them. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again from the dead? I should say this. Have you received it by faith yourself? Are you standing upon it, as he says there, by which you stand? Do you believe it? Do you put faith in it? Are you trusting in Jesus alone for your salvation? Is it you plus God, or is it just God? Is it the gospel alone, or is it maybe I'll work really hard too, and maybe between the two of us we'll get this thing worked out? Or do you say, nope, it's just the gospel? And then I ask you, friend, what is your ministry? What is your ministry? Wherever you are right now, what is it? And you may have multiple ministries. You that are, have children in your home, you've got a ministry to them right now, built in, baked in ministry. And you have ministry here at church. And I should say, if you're looking at it that way, then how are you being influenced in the gospel so that you can influence the lives of others? How is God changing you so that you can help change others? For Paul, Paul labored in preaching the gospel so that the Corinthians would believe. Now, that may not be your thing, and I get that. God works in all of us in different ways, but how is God using you right now? How is he using you right now? And what part of your life is the gospel affecting? And how are you changing because of it? In May, early May, 1820, a little girl lost her eyesight because of malpractice of an ignorant local doctor. Undeterred, the girl grew up with great uh, exuberance. She was known as being an exuberant child. She was cheerful. Uh, in fact, she was so cheerful Everybody in her life just assumed she was a Christian, even though she wasn't. But she was just the most cheerful little blind girl you'd ever meet. Now, she also determined to get an education. And you know, uh, if you've studied any kind of history, what life was like for women in the early 19th century. Uh, they didn't often get educated, but here she was. I guess they realized she wasn't going to be able to do most domestic tasks because of her blindness. So she got an education, uh, unlike many around her. And even though she grew up in this devout Christian family, she was not a Christian. And even though she was cheerful and many took her sweet spirit as an indication of salvation, she did not have any inner peace at all that, that she knew Christ as Savior. And it wasn't until she was 31 years old that she finally came to accept the gospel for herself, for salvation. And it was then, at 31, that this blind lady now found God's plan for her life. She wasn't sure what it was before. She had no idea. But, but now, trusting in Christ in her early 30s, if you can imagine, in her early 30s, she says, she says to herself, I know what God wants me to do. Because she had a real gift of writing poetry. In fact, she'd written, uh, written the words to the earliest secular cantata that, has, that was written in the United States. She was already pretty well known by the time she got saved. But after she got saved, she said, God's plan for me is to write hymn texts for the church to sing. So she started writing things like, to God be the glory and blessed assurance and redeemed how I love to proclaim it. And I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice. Or he hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. You see, no one knows for sure, but it's believed that Fanny Crosby wrote between 5,500 and 9,000 hymns during her lifetime. 9,000. Some hymnals were so filled with her songs that the publishers would use pseudonyms because they didn't want anybody to know that the hymnals people were singing from were almost entirely written by one person. 
She became so well known at the end of the 19th century that there were three names. If you lived in the 19th century in America, you would know three names. The first was Abraham Lincoln. The second was a, an evangelist preacher from New York named Charles Finney. And the third was Fanny Crosby. The gospel message produced in her a gospel ministry. What is it producing in you? Let's pray. Our Father, we give you all the thanks now for your grace that we don't deserve. We give you all the praise for the gospel. Help us now, Lord, to turn our thoughts to the gospel, to put on the glasses of the gospel and see life through your perspective as you see it. Before I finish praying, maybe there's someone here who say, Pastor, I don't know Christ. I'm not saved. I don't know Christ. I want to pray for you. Is there anybody? Just slip your hand up. Just say, Pastor, it's me. I, I am not trusting the gospel right now, and I admit it. Pray for me. Anybody at all? Don't wait, friend. If that's you, don't wait. Trust in him today. Put your faith in him today. Anybody at all? Pastor, pray for me. Pray for me. Now, maybe you're here, and or you're listening to this online, and I'm going to ask you this question. Is the gospel doing something in you? Is it producing something in you? You know, the world right now is really afraid of this virus. Don't we have an opportunity to show them what a person looks like who's trusting in Jesus? I don't mean we don't take precautions. I don't mean we don't listen to experts and get, take guidance from our governmental leaders. But I'm saying, but can't we have a spirit that says, I'm trusting in God? I, I think we can, all of us. Isn't it important that we as believers do that to other people? Show them what faith-filled people look like. And if this gets worse and much worse, can we not show them what faith-filled people will look like? Maybe you're here this morning and you're not really looking at life through the lens of the gospel. I'd love to pray for you. Are you here to say, Pastor, pray for me? As you were preaching, God's Spirit was speaking to me about something specific in my heart. And, I, and I'm just asking you to pray for me. Would you just slip up your hand? I'd love to pray for you. Anybody? Yes, brother. Who else? Pastor, pray for me. What ministry are you doing? Do you have one? What is it? If you don't, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand right now, but if you don't have one, if you're not serving God because of the gospel, then you need to make a big change right now in your life. Lord, thank you for this passage of scripture. Help us to live it out. Give us strength this week to be gospel-filled people gospel changed people that our community will see that about us we protect our our church family lord from this illness that's going around and give us safety i pray lord that you uh, would help our community leaders and our government to make wise choices and not politically expedient choices but wise choices and then lord help us all to just trust you and lord may people be saved out of this wouldn't that be a great testimony that's our desire. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good day. God bless you.